nation's capital. The Conservative Caucus presents Conservative Roundtable, an in-depth look at today's most important issues. Welcome to Conservative Roundtable. I'm Howard Phillips, chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors these broadcasts. We're privileged to have as our guest for this broadcast someone of whom you're probably well aware, Tony Blankley. Uh, his voice and visage are uh, there on your television screen, on the radio, etc. He's written best-selling books, and uh, he's done many interesting things. He was an assistant attorney general uh, in the state of California. Uh, he was a child actor, believe it or not. Uh, he was a speechwriter for Ronald Reagan. Uh, he worked for seven years uh, as the voice uh, of uh, Newt Gingrich and was involved in the promotion of the contract with America, for America. I always forget uh, <laughs> which conjunctive to use. But anyway, he's a, a very interesting man. And uh, with one or two minor exceptions, I find myself enthusiastic about what he has to say. He's written a new book, American Grit, uh, which is a very important reading. You know, a lot of people will have a guest on and uh, talk about the book without having read it, but I did read the book. I read it the other night. It's a good read. And uh, Tony, how long did it take you to write that book? Well, I, I mean, it's under 200 pages. It's meant to be a Sunday afternoon read or a flight across the country read <laughs> or a long car drive. Uh, I started thinking about it three years ago. I, I really started writing in late 2007 and more or less finished by mid-ish 2008 and then went back and started doing some rewriting because I hadn't, when I started thinking about the book, Obama was not even on the scene. The, the book is about thinking about America's place in, in the world in the 21st century. And then as a, it became apparent that Obama was likely to be the next president, and Obama seemed to embody so many of the, from my point of view, wrong-headed ideas that, that could lead America astray. I went back and started putting him in the places where I thought he, he fit uh, as the foil, if you will. There's a very interesting article in the recent edition of Newsweek uh, about Robert Cairo, who has written a series of books about Lyndon Johnson. And Cairo says that he, he rewrites and rewrites, even when the book uh, is ready to go to the printer, he rewrites. And he said that he's tempted, after the book is published, to rewrite again. And uh, getting it right and using proper grammar and precision of thought and expression is important and it's uh, difficult. How many hours a day would you spend writing it? Well, the trouble is I have a pretty full life and a family, a young daughter is still at home and, and uh, so I, the, my writing was between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. Yeah. Because I've got a full-time I, I full job and do travel on. And your full-time job is as executive vice president for global public affairs for a very prominent company. One of the world's largest public relations firms, Edelman, and, and I also do TV and radio and speaking and and uh, so I do a lot of travel for, for both uh, communication and, and for public relations. And, and so uh, it, it's, a, it's a midnight kind of a, a, yep. a chore. And as you get older, you know, getting, maintaining your mental vigor at 2 in the morning yeah. becomes trickier. <laughs> it does. Well, one of the uh, past, well, let, let me also say I found it very interesting that you describe yourself as a nationalist rather than as a conservative well, ideologue. Well, I, I describe in the book, as you know, uh, I've always considered myself, a cons I am a conservative, I used to consider myself uh, from the libertarian wing of the Reagan revolution. I, I worked for Reagan as governor and president and came out of the 60s as sort of an Ayn Randy kind of a, uh, that sort of that, that zone of it. And then as, I, as I've been progressing through life, I think I became a more, I became appreciating the traditional values more. Uh, and started moving away a little bit from the libertarian. And then after September 11th, I started realizing that as much as I fear an overbearing Washington, which I do, which is, as we know even as we watch the news, how terrifying that danger is to us, but yet there are other dangers abroad. And what happened was I was on the McLaughlin Group, which I was a regular there for 10 years. We were, it was a few years ago. We were debating the war, Iraq, and McLaughlin turned to me and said, well, what do you neocons want? 
And I said, I'm not a neocon, because I always thought of myself just as a Reaganite, kind of. And he said, well, what are you? <laughs> Which is sort of a reasonable question. And I, I, you know, the red light of the camera was on, and I was kind of thinking for a moment, and I just sort of blurted, I'm a nationalist. And that was it for the, the show. But then after the show, I thought, why did I say that? Because I, I hadn't used the word nationalist to describe me ever. Uh, you know, you think of nationalism, you think of 19th century European imperialism or, or racial pride or a lot of nonsense from the past. But I, I like the phrase, so I, I, I've embraced it in this book because I found myself increasingly, whenever I, I think about a, any public policy issue, my first question is, will it make America stronger or not? Will it make America safer or not? Not, I don't ask, first of all, will it fix my, fit my pre-existing theories and values, will it serve my personal interest? Uh, now, I'm still a, a free market, traditional values, strong military conservative, but I'm willing to consider each factual situation, decide uh, whether the nation's interest perhaps requires some modification. And after thinking that through, I, I, I remembered uh, some material from Burke where he talked about how circumstance guided by principle is the way that a statesman should deal with issues. And so, as Harold Macmillan said, events, my boy, events. Events. And, and no man is capable of developing a theory that can encompass every possible factual situation. Newton, Newtonian physics looked like it was perfect until Einstein showed that there were other facts that, that he hadn't considered. And every economic theory, I'm in favor of low taxes, I'm almost always in favor of it, but, but there may be a circumstance, maybe during World War II or somewhere, where you might want to raise taxes. So, so I'm still a conservative, I'm still a small government conservative, a traditional values conservative, but I'm a conservative nationalist. And I would like to hope that there would be liberal nationalists, people who sh don't share my general policy views, but would have as their first thought, what's going to make America stronger? Hubert Humphrey was of that vein, was he not? Yes, and, and Scoop Jackson. Yeah. The, the, and, and, Scoop and, Jackson was probably the best Democrat in my lifetime. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you don't have to be a conservative to be a nationalist or to be a patriot, whatever language you want to use. We've, we've seen in modern times, in recent years, liberals that seem not to love our country as much, not to appreciate the exceptional nature of the country, not to appreciate our traditions and values. But once upon a time, people like Humphrey and, and, and uh, Jackson and, of course, Jack Kennedy and, and others, they, were, they, they shared their love, the, the conservatives' love of American values and traditions. They had different economic theories. There were a couple of things in uh, Obama's uh, inaugural address which I found encouraging, which manifested a degree of patriotism and concern for the country. Unfortunately, what he said in that speech was in conflict with what he's been doing. Well, just to talk about Obama just for a second, because I did a column on his inaugural address yeah. because I thought it was a, a cunningly designed one. He, I believe he tries to create a, a, an ambiguity that he wants to be a, attractive to as wide a philosophical spectrum as he can until the last possible moment. And, but that in fact, he is going to use the themes of traditional American values to shape a very different kind of a more collectivist policy. And I, I, in my column, I said it's as if you were to take the planks from old Ironside and reassemble them as sort of a collectivist arc. And, and, and so it's going gonna, it's gonna to look sort of similar. He's going to use those, talk about George Washington and crossing the Delaware and all of that. And yet, he's going to take us to a place that I think a lot of us conservatives don't want to go. And the best evidence of that is uh, his apparent intention to significantly reduce defense spending. Well, yes. Now, there's a little bit of confusion on, on exactly what he's going to do because his Office of Management Budget has said they're going to increase the defense budget by 8%, which would be a reasonable number given low inflation. But the Iraq War and the Afghan War are being paid not out of the defense budget, but out of su what's called supplemental appropriations, another, another bill. And a lot of that money, because it's, it's hard to div div separate the war from certain Pentagon and weapons systems activities, a lot of that money really is part of the defense budget. So he could give the defense, the, the technical defense budget, an 8% increase, and then ask for less money in the supplementals and net out with a 10% or, or whatever percent loss. And I've talked to 50 a, billion. And I've talked to both one budget official at the Pentagon and one weapons system manager 
who both told me that they've got word that they have to start whittling down their budgets. Yeah. So I, am, I think that we're likely to see a reduction effectively in the Defense Department's budget. I'm very concerned about what's happening in Latin America. It's not merely Hugo Chavez. Uh, it's not merely Raul Castro. It's not merely the leadership in Ecuador and Bolivia. There's a, there's a large strain of anti-Americanism uh, throughout Latin America. But I have to say I am outraged uh, at the growing communist Chinese influence at the Isthmus of Panama, control of the ports at both ends. I've been there frequently, and I've, I've met with people from Hutchins and Juan Poa who, who controls that. And what really ticked me off was that uh, the Russians uh, docked a ship at what was once the Rodman naval base in Panama, and reading uh, Panama press reports just a couple of days ago, I've discovered that they have given a broadcast license to Moscow to have uh, around-the-clock coverage of uh, Russian news. You know, you're absolutely right, and, and it reminds <laughs> one of the, apparently, maybe it's a cliche, but, but the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. Yeah. You let down your guard for a yeah. moment. <clears throat> and there's always going to be some country, some yep. group, they're going to try to grab. And, and, and even we've had you know, eight years of, of a Republican administration, and they've let down their guard to some extent. Now, I, I think overall the Bush policy has not been too bad towards And China. now you've got the Russians flying bear bombers yes. uh, into Latin America airports and military bases. Uh, you've got uh, a naval presence by them in, in the uh, Atlantic. Uh, we really need to rebuild the U.S. Navy. John Lehman and even Jim Webb, when they were in charge of the Navy, did a very good job of building it up under President Reagan. He was committed uh, not just to equality but supremacy, and that's what the policy should be. It should be supremacy. And, of course, uh, you, know, you maintain peace, as, as the phrase goes, through strength. Peace through you strength. induce war and death for your troops by weakness. That's right. And so when people think that they, they can avoid the tragedy of, of young American troops being killed by not being militaristic and not building up your military, the reverse invariably yeah. happens. It, it's the overwhelming power that doesn't have to prove itself. And it's the we have to take a break, Tony. Please stay with us. We'll be back with Tony Blankley right after these messages. Hi, I'm United States Representative Thaddeus McCotter from Michigan's 11th Congressional District. As we enter a new millennium of hope and peril, with so many problems besetting our country and yet so many opportunities before us, it is oftentimes tempting to think that your voice doesn't matter. What can one person do to make a difference in the life of their community and their country? Well, the first thing you can do is to contact your legislator. You are one of the sovereign citizens of the United States. You elect your servants to work for you in Congress. Let them know what you think. Send them a letter, send them an email, call them on the phone. Your voice matters. Because if you don't raise your voice in the interests of our free republic, who will? Welcome back. I'm Howard Phillips, Chairman of the Conservative Caucus, which sponsors Conservative Roundtable. And we're very fortunate to have as our guest for this edition of Conservative Roundtable, uh, Tony Blankley, uh, who has done so many things that would take up uh, much of the broadcast if I were merely to recount his achievements, his accomplishments, and his interests. And I agree with Tony on a lot of things. And I read his book, and I thought it was wonderful. But there's one area, Tony, yep. where you and I disagree, and that's the draft. I think uh, the, the, the draft, and by the way, in 68, I was campaign manager for uh, Dick Swiker when he defeated Joe Clark mm -hmm. for the Senate in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and uh, one of the main uh, issues in our campaign was a volunteer army, uh, and it, it resonated well with the people. My concern is that when you have a draft, it presupposes that the government owns the kid. It presupposes that uh, uh, the child, the son, and now the daughter is uh, subservient 
uh, not to the parents, but to the government. How, how do you well, challenge that? Well, I mean, you, you can make, I mean, I had a wonderful debate with a radio host uh, a, week, a week ago, and he was talking about indentured servants in the constitutional... Thirteenth Amendment. Yeah, and, and, uh, Which, now, by the way, doesn't apply here, now the, as the, you know. Yeah. Now, the fact is, obviously, I mean, and I don't want to stand on, on, a, on a mere legality, but the draft has been held to be constitutional throughout our history. We've had it... We've, interestingly, we've had it in, in five wars. Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam. So, Okay. In, uh, and, of course, in the Civil War, we had draft you, you could buy your well, way this out. Is, this is my point, that there were two wars when the draft was unpopular. The Civil War, because you could buy for three or four hundred dollars your way out, and the Vietnam, where you could effectively buy by going to college. And so it was a working class that got drafted, they, and it was an unfair draft, yeah. and it was correct that the public ought to be outraged by it. The wars where it was universal, World War One, World War Two, and Korean, it was popularly accepted because it was seen to be just and part of something the nation needed. The Supreme Court was was about to consider the constitutionality of the draft in World War One, according to my friend, the late Dr. R. J. Rushdoony, but for political reasons, not wanting to oppose Wilson, uh, they chickened out. Rushdoony said there are uh, a few circumstances where it's legitimate. Uh, one is to repel foreign invasion, another is to suppress domestic insurrection, and there's another I forget at the moment what that third one is. But uh, uh, for the reason I stated, it's a matter of concern. Now, an area where you and I would agree is how outrageous the income tax is. You know, it's amazing how much of the Communist Manifesto has been incorporated in public policy in the United States. The graduated income Graduate, tax, yep. central banking, all of this kind of stuff, uh, government control of education, all of these well, things. Well, I, I can remember when... We were so uh, in the Golden Border campaign. We were still arguing there should be no federal aid to education. You know? I mean, I know you remember. I remember that. it well. When we were still arguing that there was no federal role. I agree. And, and now, obviously, we I, have. I've a, not abandoned that no, position. No, but but <laughs> th there's no doubt that there's been an accretion, no. uh, obviously, uh, of of right of power in, in in Washington. I don't want to add to it. The only reason I, I, I'm for the draft is because I don't. I don't believe America is likely to be able to be strong enough to protect our sovereignty and our freedom for the next 50 or 100 years unless you make, do a lot of things that are smart and tough. And, the, I mean, we didn't have enough troops to fight the, the Iraq war properly. We've lost so far almost 4,300 troops dead in Iraq. I supported the war. I still support it. Uh, and, we, and several thousand more. Uh, seriously wounded. Now, I, have, I, I love the, the, the volunteer. I have a young son who's a newly minted second lieutenant really? in the Army. Uh, How old is he? he? He's 19. I think. He, he did the, well, the, he's, he's pretty advanced. He's, he, did the, he did the one year ROTC. He went to, he's been going to military school. He's, uh, and, and, and now he's, he's a commissioned second lieutenant. He's in the National Guard uh, and he's finishing off his last two years of college and then he's hoping to make it into special forces when he, when he goes active. And I've met a lot of his chums and men and, and young ladies, and, and they're the most wonderful people in the world. But the fact is, we, didn't, we, we don't have enough volunteers, and we're not going to get enough. I mean, well, we'll get a little bit more now. The economy's bad. They'll probably pick up 50, 100,000 more people may join, which is not the best reason to join, by the way. Most of them, my son and so many others, didn't join for the money. They joined because they, were, they wanted to defend their country. Uh, but the fact is that if we had done what some of the generals told us before, that we c shouldn't go into Iraq without, you know, two or three or four hundred thousand troops to fall. We only need 80,000 to knock off the Republican Guard, but we didn't have enough to occupy the country. And so then the, the, the resistance, the, the insurrection started. And once it started, we started losing the, the troops. And to me, the most heartbreaking part of the Iraq war is the casualties, the typical casualty, which is from the roadside bomb, the lost legs, and the brain, traumatic brain injuries that comes from this. High suicide rate. Because we didn't... Because we didn't have enough troops to send in squads of mine clearers. As we in World War II, we wouldn't send our, our infantry through until we cleared the mines. Now we didn't have the troops, so we just sent our young men rolling over those uninspected roads, and they blow up in, the, in their legs and in their face. So you say people say we don't need more. We need more troops that we could raise, even for Iraq, which is a small regional war. We're a country of 300 million people. And we can't raise enough troops to effectively and promptly fight a, a regional war. 
In World War II, we were a country of 125 million. We raised 16 million troops, and we could conquer the world. Now, this is a dangerous world. It's going to get more dangerous. There are probably going to be resource wars, struggles that we can't imagine. Mexico could, I can only, you watch what's going, the chaos in Mexico. What happens if the Mexico... We may need troops We there. may need troops to, to man that border before long. We're already, Phoenix has already got the second highest... Uh, kidnapping yep. rate in, in the world. Second only to Mexico, Mexico City. Mexico City, and it's, pro it's because of their proximity to Mexico. So there's already... And the difference between Juarez and El Paso is unbelievable. Uh, it, the, the, we're already... We probably should be. Ha we probably should have half a million troops on that, on that border right now, and we may need more than that. What happens if Pakistan goes jihadi? And we need to send in troops to, to secure the nuclear weapons so we don't have a holocaust. What happens if the Saudis succumb to a jihadi rebellion? They, 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 they've got lots of Shias living on top of the oil fields. If we had to go in there to seize the oil fields, to get the oil out so the whole world economy didn't completely collapse, we don't have the troops to do any of these things. We're stretched thin, and we, we have not the, the greatest challenges facing us now. So I argue, as a nationalist, I, I, I would prefer not to have a draft. I, I, I'm so proud of my son for joining the army, but I, I, we have a lot of member, family members and ancestors who fought. Most of them were English. But, but How do you feel about the homosexualization of the military, which is coming under Obama? Look, the, the, whatever you th live and let live. I, I, I don't care what people do, but the point of a military is to be an effective fighting force, and the esprit de corps is central to that. And I haven't met a serious either officer or, or theoretician re, who's familiar with the military who doesn't think that this will break down the, the kind of, of, of spree that you need to, to be in combat. And, and to some extent, the same thing applies uh, to, to women in some settings. I, I think there's a role. My, my wife is a retired Army captain. Is she really? In, in the uh, Florida National Guard. She, she actually won the Iron Man Award. Is which that went, right? Which went to Fort Benning. Uh, Did you know her before or after that? No, before. She, she was actually the world's oldest second lieutenant. She wanted to get in, and, <laughs> and she couldn't get in because she was like 38 or something. And she had Senator Domenici, who at the time was... Uh, Pete Domenici the, of New Mexico. Yeah, who controlled the budget. And he held the budget back until they gave, a, gave her a waiver so she could get in. So we have a long military tradition in the family. Isn't that interesting? Uh, but, but she was signal corps. That was not a combat. You know, the, the roles that women are very good at, and we need, we need them, and there's no reason why they shouldn't serve, but they should not be serving in, 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 in combat zones. And there's some question about how they operate on, on naval ships. There's some problems here. Our time is rapidly running out. We have to talk about the economy. Yes. I think one of the worst years in American history was 1913, uh, which went to a direct election of senators, which gave <laughs> extraordinary power to big money and big media, one of the reasons why campaigns are so expensive and why you almost have to be an affluent person in order to seek election to the Senate. Uh, another problem was the supposed ratification of the 16th Amendment approved by Philander Knox, uh, William Howard Taft's uh, Secretary of State, and the third was the creation of the Fed, which in my view is patently unconstitutional. It's in conflict with what the Constitution says. And I would argue that we're headed for the real danger of hyperinflation as a result of the doubling of the money supply under the Fed. In just the last few months, yeah. uh, and, and with more to come, with much more to come. I mean, the government... The Fed has guaranteed, depending on how you calculate it, somewhere between two or three and seven or eight trillion dollars of li potential liability that they would have to, if they if they had to, uh, if they called on it. It's sort of like you know co-signing a loan. You may not get called, but if you called, you got to deliver. Yeah. And they would have to do it by monetarizing, by by simply creating capital. And there's no doubt, I, I, or little doubt, that 18 months from now we're going to start seeing inflation at a very yeah. dangerous rate. We're running out of time, but I have to ask you a personal question. Yeah. Um, what was it in your early life that sparked your interest in public policy? Was it a book you read? No, I can tell you exactly what it was. Tell me. We, my parents were Londoners. We, we were English. And I was brought up around our dinner table. My dad talked about World War II, how England got into World War II because the politics of England failed because his friends thought that appeasement made sense. My dad didn't. My dad was a Tory and, and he was a Churchill advocate. In fact, my dad became Churchill's, one of Churchill's accountants before World War II, briefly. So I learned that politics...
con has consequences, that the bombs fell on my parents' homes and, and neighbors' homes in London in 1940 because the politics of, of, of England in the 30s failed. And so from the time I was a four or five years old, I understood that, that politics is the first duty of a citizen. We have to break. We're running out of time. We'll have just a minute or two left when we come back. Please stay with us for some concluding comments uh, by our friend Tony Blankley. This is Duncan Hunter, uh, Congressman San Diego, and you know I built that border fence that we use in San Diego right now, the double fence, and I wrote the law that takes a, a fence some 700 plus miles across Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, and California. And I just want to urge everyone, stand strong on border control and don't uh, don't open the door to uh, amnesty because if you open the door to amnesty we're going to see massive waves of folks coming into this country illegally uh, who and you'll have lots of people coming in illegally expecting to catch the next amnesty and the next amnesty we need border control and we need to enforce existing laws hang in there welcome back i'm howard phillips our guest has been Tony Blankley, and you can contact him for further information uh, by checking out the number on the screen. If you're interested in the kinds of issues we discuss on Conservative Roundtable, uh, you can uh, check out our website for the Conservative Caucus, conservativeusa.org. Uh, our fax number is 703-281-4108. Uh, drop us a note. We'll send you no cost or obligation information. We have one minute left, Tony. It's all yours. Well, I just go on one little theme because it's something I've been thinking about. I have it in my book. And it's a question of duties and privileges of citizenship. And it's just struck me that in the last few decades, Americans, all of us, have tended to focus on our privileges and our prerogatives. Uh, and it's time, I think, to rebalance the scale and think a bit more about our duties as citizens. You know, there's a reason why you live a better life here than someone who was born in sub-Saharan Africa or Bangladesh. It's not because we're better than them. It's because our traditions and values are, are superior in creating a healthy life for free people. And, you, and, and we, ought to, we owe something to keep that going. There's a, you know, we, don't, we don't just live south of Canada and north of Mexico. We live in the United States of America. And the difference between that and Bangladesh we should appreciate and commit to. And by the way, that's why we oppose something called the North American Union. We can do a whole show on that. Maybe you can do a column on it at some point. I'd love point. to. <laughs> okay. Tony, thank you so much for being with us. We really appreciate it. Bless.